Welcome to Finance and Excel video number 68. Hey, if you want to download this workbook for chapter 8 or the PowerPoints for chapter 8, click on the link below the video and scroll way down to the Finance Excel class section. Hey, we are in chapter 8. Chapter 8. And we're going to talk about capital budgeting, which is just, hey, what assets should we buy for our business? And since we're buying assets, that is an investment. So we have to think, um, look at investment criteria. We're going to talk about net present value in this chapter, payback rule, accounting rates of return, internal rate of return, and profitability index. The only one that has a check mark by it is net present value, because that is the best uh, model to use when deciding what to invest in. The other ones we'll look at, and people do use them, but they will we'll look at their drawbacks also. Now, what in the world is capital budgeting? It is just um, the business of acquiring long-term assets, right? If you're UPS, you have to figure out what kind of trucks you're going to buy. If you're looking to take over another company, you have to analyze those companies and see if it's a good investment long-term assets. Now this is very important because they determine the nature of the firm, right? When you buy a bunch of assets, um, oftentimes those decisions are hard to reverse. Um, and they determine the nature of the business th itself, and so they are the most important decisions for financial managers, right? So when we're selecting a assets, what assets to invest in, y you know, there's oftentimes many options. So which do we pick? Well, that's what this chapter is all about. Now, we got these different uh, investment criteria here. These will be uh, models we'll use to decide whether to buy a particular asset. Now, for all of these, or any model you use, you want to ask these questions. Does the decision rule adjust for the time value of money? Does the decision rule adjust for risk? Does the decision rule provide information on whether we're creating value for the firm. Remember, one of the um, important goals of a financial manager is to bring value to the firm. So one, two, three. So as we look through each one of these, we'll always ask those three questions and see what the answer. If the answer is yes, time value of money, yes, it adjusts for risk, yes, it uh, tells us whether we're adding value. If it's yes, 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 then we have a pretty darn good rule. Now, we're going to start off in this video talking about net present value. So net present value, we're just going to refer to it as NPV. It's just the difference between the market value and its cost. That's be the value added. So we're going to do from the point of view of the asset buyer, here's the cost, minus $200,000. Uh, we go out there and we determine the market value is this. So we simply dis, uh, subtract whatever the market value is minus the cost. And in this case, it's positive. Anytime you get a positive net present value, you're adding value to the firm. Anytime you get a negative, you are taking away value. Net present value. Now, if there is a market for the actual asset, like uh, bonds, right, or uh, stocks, right? You can go out and maybe find similar co uh, companies. So if there's a market for the asset, you go out into that market and get the price, the market value, whatever that is, right? That means people are buying and selling. Market value just means, hey, when I sell it, how much did I get for it? That is the market value. You never know market value until you actually sell it. Well, for some assets, there are markets. You can go and look at the actual um, price um, or look at similar assets. However, when you cannot observe a market price for at least a roughly comparable investment, what do you do? Discounted cash flow valuation. Ah, we've already been doing this. And we use that to get our net present value. Very important. Discounted cash flow valuation gives us an estimate of market value. And discounted cash flow valuation, as we've already seen, you're looking at future cash flows. Well, wait a second. What's one thing we know about the future? The future is unknown. So anytime you do discounted cash flow valuation, you are making assumptions. You are making estimates about the unknown future. All right. Nevertheless, you do your best to try and uh, estimate um, 
as uh, best you can. You discount those future cash flows back, and that'll give us our estimate for the market value. All right, but remember, market value is just uh, one part. We have uh, the actual market value here in this example minus the cost, and that'll always give us the net present value. Now, a few things before we jump over to Excel. Synonyms, uh, that means similar words, discounted cash flow valuation and net present value, those are synonyms, uh, oftentimes interchange. But remember, net present value really is just whatever the market value is minus the cost. And so however you get that market value, you're, maybe you're using discounted cash flow valuation, or maybe you're looking out into the, the market and seeing observing a price. Uh, another synonym, a set of synonyms in this uh, these videos and the textbook, investment equals project equals asset. See, we're financial managers inside the firm trying to decide what asset to buy. So yeah, we're buying an asset, but it's an investment, and oftentimes we just call it a project. I'll use these interchangeably. All right, rules for discounted cash flow or NPV first. Estimate the future, expected future cash flows. We'll talk about that in nine. That is hard to do, right? In this chapter, we're just going to be given them. In chap next chapter, we'll talk about. Um, we'll look at ways to estimate them. Second step is to estimate the required return for projects. Uh, chapter 10, 11, and uh, 12 gets into talking about that. And whatever the required return is, that's inside the company. This is the return you said. We must, the, we have this required return. We must earn this amount or more, or we're not investing in the project. So the required return for projects, and this will incorporate the risk, right? So if you're inside the company calculating the required return, if the project is really risky, then the required return is going to be higher. The higher the risk, the higher the return. Finally, the third step, that's what we're learning in this chapter, the, the kind of math behind it, uh, is to find the present value of the cash flows and subtract the initial investment, right? So that's kind of the math of it. All right. Um, oh, guess what? We already know how to do this. Um, in fact, we, we haven't specifically called it net present value. Actually, in uh, a video maybe about 10 videos ago or something, I did in one video mention that we do this because we were doing discounted cash flows of multiple cash flows, right? Bringing them back and getting a price today. And what we said in earlier chapters was, well, if this is the estimated value, right? If we go out, if we think it's 100 bucks and we go out into the market and see 90, our estimate is 100 and it's selling for 90, we would buy it, right? That's how we said in earlier chapters. But in this chapter, we just, we have a rule. Here's the cash flow at time zero. That means whatever you're paying, plus all the discounted future cash flows. Now, in this chapter, or in past chapters, I've used I for all of our math, all the way consistent, consistently in this class. I means the discount rate equals the market rate equals the required rate of return equals RRR. So in a lot of the videos coming up, I'll just list uh, RRR and then maybe discount in parentheses. But this is our discounting rate or required rate of return. Remember, when we were in bonds, what do we call it? Yield to market. Chapters 4 and 5, we called it discount uh, rate uh, or market rate. Here, we're going to call it required rate of return because this is capital budgeting. Inside the firm, do I buy an asset? That required return is very important. But it's from the point of view of the person inside the firm. All right, the rest of the um, variables are the same. Ah, but what is so cool about this chapter, um, and we'll jump over to Excel. Actually, slide 15 formalize. It's just this is straightforward, kind of totally obvious, right? Net present value. If we calculate net present value and it's greater than zero, that means we're adding value. We accept the project. Anytime we get a net present value of less than zero, we reject the project. Um, right equal to uh, indifferent because the required rate of return equals the internal rate of return, which we'll talk about later. But that's our formal rule. Anytime we get a positive net present value, you take the project. Um, I was looking for the slide here. I think I skipped over. Oh, there it is. Ah, we get to learn about a new function. Why weren't we using this all along? Uh, net present value, NPV. 
we're gonna and actually this is the reason why we weren't using it all along is because here's one of these weird functions that's gonna seem to like the programmers didn't create it properly since net present value is cash flow at time zero the cost and then all the future cash flows discounted back you'd think that the net present value function when you put in value one value one is just all of the cash flows right you'd think that they'd have you put in cash flow at time zero but they don't and what's even more confusing is when we learn about internal rate of return IRR that function was built correctly and it does include time zero so very important uh, cash flow starts at time one. Never include cash flows at time zero. So this is what it's going to look like. We're going to put our rate in and then all of our future cash flows and it will give us our net present value. But here's what we're always going to have to do if we're actually calculating the net present value. We're then going to have to subtract the cost. All right. Now what's so amazing about net present value function is that you just put in one rate and all the cash flows and it does all the math all that complicated math even if it has you know uh, 35 future cash flows alright let's jump over to Excel um, here's our um, annual discount rate or a required rate of return the asset cost 200,000 and we've estimated 100,000 in at the end of at the end of the first year, 90,000 and 70,000. So these are our estimated future cash flows. If it costs 200,000 bucks, do we buy it? Now, again, chapter next chapter we'll talk a little bit about estimating these and then in future chapters we'll talk about estimating this. But there it is. There's our discount rate. We already know how to do this, right? We have done this. We're going to do the present value function. We're going to do this once just to remind us and then from this point forward we'll use the net present value. But here it is. We're a, seeing this same um, this uh, value of an asset here using net present value but with a technique we already know how to do so the rate I'm gonna click right there and hit F4 now almost every example in this chapter is annual right in earlier chapters we did all this you know compounding 12 times a year but most every example is gonna be annual so that's the annual rate we're just gonna use it but remember that's the period rate comma NPER one period to uh, discount this cash flow back, comma, PMT, we don't have any future value, that's this, and it is positive, right? The type we um, don't need here, close parentheses and control enter. I can drag this down. Now, price we're willing to pay, this is exactly what we did in earlier chapters, alt equals. So there it is. We're willing to pay 201,000. So if we go out and see the price uh, is minus is 200,000, right? We're willing to pay more than this. So of course we are going to um, buy this asset. Now here's how we in a couple ten videos ago did this. We did value added by adding by buying at 200,000, which is the net present value. We say and I'm going to go minus this. Now remember, this is correct. That's a cash flow out. When we did our valuation here, it says we're willing to have this much cash out. But for our calculation, net present value, we need a positive, And then we're going to subtract. But um, since this is a negative up here, we're going to add. So right, that is our equation. Net present value is whatever the market value, or in this case, our estimate of market value minus the cost and we get $1,035, right, and 59 cents. So that's the value added by um, buying this particular asset. Now remember, the whole concept here, this is all present value, right? We can see clearly we did use our present value function, but these are future cash flows. So what we did, we actually took all the return out. So when you get $100,000 and discount it back one period, you have 86. So the difference between these is our expected 15% return. And so we did that for each cash flow, got our estimation of market value. Now let's go to the exciting uh, conclusion here. The net present value function, just simply amazing, equals net present value. The rate, that's always period rate, but we're doing annual here, so I'm going to click there. And, comma, get this, you just have to highlight. That's it. That is a lot easier than any of our other uh, financial functions we've seen so far. 
right? So, but this is one, two, three. Cash flow start at one and go out. Now, by the way, this function knows if you have three cash flows that that there's three periods. Now, just like our earlier functions when we did an annuity, the time period between these has to be the same, right? So end of year one, end of year two, end of year three. But that's it. This function is counting. We don't have to, like earl earlier functions, like future value, present value, we don't have to put how many periods. It can figure it out, right? All right, that's um, if we control enter, that's the price we're willing to pay. And notice that the nest net present value or th these are this is the current value of these future cash flows here notice it's positive right so they program the net present value um, slightly differently uh, different s slightly different than uh, the other functions this doesn't come up negative like the um, present value no problem for net present value calculation it's perfect now I'm going to add which is subtracting our cost and boom and that's how you do it that formula right there is we're going to use throughout the rest of this class often. All right, um, net present value, the net present value function, and the net present value formula with the cost subtracted at the end. When we come back, we'll learn about building a net present value profile, which is very important. All right, see you next video.